just reading your, your report, I'm guessing this all happened or you wrote this before we, we heard of these flash PMIs in Europe, the, the, the contraction that we saw in manufacturing in the U.S. and, of course, more lockdowns that we're hearing in, in parts of Asia as well. How difficult is it now to make these types of assumptions when this is such a fluid situation and the data right now doesn't, ex doesn't exactly reflect the full extent of this outbreak? Yeah, good morning. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. So the number that you, that you quoted in terms of global GDP growth, 1.3%, you know, we put that together a week ago, a little more than a week ago, which seems like an awfully long time ago. We were, we were then thinking about sort of two, so, two scenarios or two cases. One is the base case, which we set those numbers to, which was a, really a global contraction in Q1 and Q2, recovery in Q, Q3 and Q4. The downside would have been the lockdowns expanding, the economic impact being more severe, unemployment taking hold, and the global economy really contracting for the year as a whole. I think we're moving rapidly towards that downside uh, scenario. So the numbers that, that, that are coming in to the extent that we have them, but more importantly, maybe the anecdotal evidence is really telling us that, that this, the economic situation is, is getting worse than what we ex had expected just a week ago. James, when it comes to China, though, after the severe contraction that we saw in February, what's the trajectory for a recovery now? And do you think China could actually come to the rescue like it did before in past crisis? Well, yes, China's a little bit ahead of the curve. We're, start, we're, we're seeing in, in some numbers not only the anecdotal evidence and the issues you've been talking about in terms of the Wuhan uh, restrictions being, being lifted soon, but things like steel demand in production has, has bounced back. So, you know, one thing to remember about the Chinese economy is it is accustomed to shutting down for a period of time each year around the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year holidays. So this is, this is not new for China to shut down and open up. Okay, this was a much longer period and much more pronounced. But, you know, we do think there can be a bounce back in, in China that might be a little bit more aggressive than what we see in, in other jurisdictions. I think there's probably two risks around that. One, which you've mentioned, is a potential return of the virus. I don't think anyone is out of the woods yet, including including China. That's, that's a fairly significant risk. And two, is just that China being a little bit out of sync with the rest of the world in terms of the recovery. China being ahead of the rest of the world, meaning that China might be growing uh, or moving into a recovery period, um, but they're going to be faced with very weak external demand conditions. So those are two things we have to think about even in the recovery of, of China itself. Uh, James, China is ahead. India is a laggard. It's just announced a 21-day lockdown. How might that impact its already weak economy? Yeah, look, it's, 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 it's really the same story in every country we look at. The, the, the questions are um, uh, really from a policy perspective, what can the authorities do about that? And when you think about the starting position of, say, the Chinese uh, fiscal position, which you were mentioning earlier, versus India's fiscal position, uh, again, China had a much better starting point from that. Government debt in India is already quite high. The, the general government runs a fairly large uh, deficit already, so there's less scope and, and less uh, yeah, less room, I suppose, less fiscal room for India to take on uh, a massive stimulus in, in, in dealing with the crisis. We certainly don't have any indication that the authorities are contemplating uh, a massive uh, fiscal support package, but it will make it a little bit harder for them to introduce one if they choose to, um, and it may be constrained in the size uh, relative to what we see in other countries. James, it's probably fair to say that we can forget about a V-shaped recovery. It's either a U or an L. What's your base case assumption and any countries, any economies at risk of a downgrade? Well, there's, there's probably quite a few countries at risk of, of downgrades. We've got a number that are on negative outlook already, and I think even the ones that are on stable outlooks, we're going to have to really review almost the entire sovereign rating portfolio. So I don't think there's any that we can that we can skip over and say everything's going to be fine there. It's really a question of degree and, and the starting position. As to the shape of the recovery, uh, yeah, maybe V is starting to look a little bit, a little bit optimistic. 
dramatic, in part because of that lack of synchronized uh, recovery. So as some countries come out, you know, they're faced with weak external demand elsewhere. The other thing to think about, I think, which is critical, is in, in, in the downturn, you know, how severe is that downturn going to be and what kind of damage does it do, particularly to the labor market? So if there's a loss of employment during that downturn, which we think there will certainly be quite a pronounced loss of employment in the U.S. where labor markets are flexible, more flexible than they are in Europe. That could do lasting, uh, a little bit more lasting damage could be uh, as, a result of, as a result of that weakness in the labor market. In other words, is there a job to go back to when, when the economies begin to recover? And I think the longer and more pronounced uh, those downturns are, the, the higher the likelihood is that we will be dealing with uh, stress in the labor market, uh, especially in those flexible labor markets like the U.S.